Welcome back and let's do a quick summary of the previous lesson before we get into the deeper side of the pool. So if you wish to find the electric field due to a charged particle, what we learned in the last lesson was that you need to do so by placing a positive test charge Q0 at any point near the particle, uh, say at a distance R, then from Coulomb's law, the force experienced by the test charge due to charge Q is given by the equation F is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon Q into Q naught upon R square times R cap where R cap is nothing but a unit vector pointing in the direction of the force. And the direction of this force will always point away from the particle if Q has a positive charge and towards it if Q is negative. We can then define electric field at that point as force per unit charge or E is equal to F upon Q naught. Or we could write E is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon Q upon R square R cap. Now, you would have noticed that I have put a small R cap here, which is just a unit vector as I explained earlier, and it indicates the direction of the field. So do not end up canceling this R with this R. Well, this is, um, I should say, a more complete representation of expression for electric field that we discussed in the previous lesson, since it also includes a direction of E. And just to make this point clearer, the value of E would be this as we showed in the earlier lesson. And if you attach an R cap, if you multiply R cap, the expression also indicates the direction of the field. Okay, so let's go ahead and ask ourselves, what if there are several charges and we are asked to find the electric field E at a point due to this collection of charges. Well, in such a case, what we'll do is first find the vector sum of forces acting on the test charge due to all charges at that point, and let us say this vector sum is F0. Uh, then we can find the net E, or simply E at this point, by dividing F0 by Q0, just the way you, we would have done if there was a single charge. So E here is equal to F0 upon Q0. And if we put the value of F0 here, what we get is E is equal to F1 upon Q0 plus F2 upon Q0 plus F3 upon Q0 and so on and so forth till you reach the nth particle, which would be Fn upon Q0. But then you see each of these quantities is the electric field due to each charge. So we can write the above equation as E is equal to E1 plus E2 plus E3 and so on till we reach En. So what we see is that we can find the value of E at this point in two ways. One, you find the net force due to all charges and divided by Q0 or you find E due to each charge and then add them vectorially. So when we attempt numerical problems later, uh, depending on uh, what is the available information, we will use either method. So with this understanding of force and electric field produced by a point charge, let us move on to something which, uh, well, I would say would be a, a step up in understanding the topic. So we will now try to figure out what is a field set up by a dipole or a pair of charges along its axis. So an electric dipole essentially consists of two particles uh, with charges of equal magnitude but opposite in signs separated by a small distance d. And what you see here are the electric field lines uh, generated by such particles uh, with D lying along the dipole axis. This is also, you can see, uh, is the axis of symmetry. And you can imagine rotating this pattern 
around this axis. So let us consider this as the Z axis. You can uh, also make a quick observation from what you learned so far that field lines always originate from a positive charge and terminate at a negative charge. So let us go ahead and find the magnitude and direction of the electric field at some point P along this dipole axis that is at a distance Z that is this point P is at a distance Z from the dipoles midpoint. So what we can see here is that each charge would set up an electric field at point P independently as if the other charge was not there. Now this charge here being positive produces field E1 that points in this direction while the negative charge sets up field E2 in the negative Z direction. And a quick observation would be that the strength of electric field E1 due to plus Q would be more than what is set up by minus Q that is E2 since it is farther from point P. And, and therefore you can see that the length of vector E2 is less than that of E1. Now considering that the field vectors are along the same axis, we could just indicate the vector direction with plus or a minus sign. So then we can write the net field at P as simply equal to E1 minus E2, which should equal one upon four pi epsilon naught Q upon R1 square minus one upon four pi epsilon naught Q upon R2 square. And you can also see that R1 is nothing but equal to z minus d upon 2 and r2 is z plus d upon 2. So if we use these values in this equation what we get is this expression simplifies to this and if we apply a little algebra here by pulling z out z becomes z square as it comes out and what you get here is this expression and if we take a common denominator this further simplifies into this expression. Now in applied physics, what is usually of interest is to establish the electrical effect of dipole at distances that are significantly larger than the distance D or say Z values that are much larger than D. And if we agree on this, what we find is that D upon 2Z would be much less than 1 and therefore the square value should be even smaller, uh, so much small that probably we can ignore this. And if we do this, this equation changes to a very simple expression that is E is equal to one upon two pi epsilon QD upon Z cube. And this product QD you see here is what combines the two intrinsic properties of a dipole that is charge Q and separation D and is famously termed as the electric dipole moment of the dipole and is a vector quantity with QD being its value. And if you see this figure uh, as well as the field lines in this figure, we will find the direction of net E for any distant point on the axis will always be the direction of the dipole moment vector. Now this would be true for any point on either side of the dipole and also uh, if you like mathematics you will see that if you double the distance of a point from a dipole the value of E at that point will drop by a factor of 8 considering the inverse cube relationship. So uh, if let us say the initial value was z and you made it 2z, the factor here will change to 8z and therefore uh, it becomes 1 8th of the original value. But if you were to double the distance from a single point charge, the electric field drops by a factor of 4 only considering inverse square relationship. So you see the electric field of a dipole decreases a lot faster as you move away from it compared to a single charge. Well, if you think a little deeper, the reason for this rapid fall in electric field for a dipole is that if you were to see this pair from a distance, 
the pair would uh, kind of be so close uh, the the two charges plus q minus q would be so close that they almost coincide compared to the distance from where they're being observed and uh, since they have charges of same magnitude and opposite sign the electric fields they produce at a distant point almost cancels each other well see another way that if this was not a dipole but say a plus 3 coulomb charge and a minus 1 coulomb charge plus 3 would have dominated and the net charge would have been plus 2 that would have produced the electric field uh, at that point but here in a dipole in a pure dipole with a plus charge and a minus q charge they are equal and opposite and therefore tend to cancel each other when seen from a distance and hence as you move away from the dipole the fall in E is very sharp. So let us now examine what would be the force and torque of an electric dipole if it is dropped in a uniform electric field of strength E. So here we are not talking about dipole's own electric field but an external electric field in which it has been put and what is of interest here is the force that this field impresses on the charges and the resulting torque. So you can see that both charges experience a force of equal magnitude but in opposite direction and they therefore add up to zero. So the net force is zero. But you can also observe that the two forces do not act along the same line and you will recall from earlier lessons on torque that such an arrangement will result in the dipole experiencing a torque or what we termed as a twisting force that will make the dipole turn around in clockwise or anti-clockwise direction depending on the direction of the field E. Now in this arrangement you can see that it would experience a twisting force or torque that will turn it in clockwise direction. So let us go ahead and try to find the torque about the center of this dipole due to the electric field. Now if we take the angle between the electric field and the axis of dipole as alpha then the torque on this charge would be cross product of d by 2 and f which therefore is equal to d by 2 qe because QE is a force into sine alpha and the same would be the value of torque on this charge as well but in opposite direction. And you can see that both the torques tend to rotate the dipole in clockwise direction and, and therefore by convention both the torques are directed into the page and that is the direction of torque as a vector. So beware while the torque is uh, creating a, a clockwise motion of the dipole but the direction of the torque as a vector is into the page. Well you could also establish the direction of the torque by applying the right hand rule or um, the corkscrew rule whichever you're familiar to find the direction of the torque as a vector and you'll get the same direction that is pointing into the page. So if you add up the two vectors what you get is torque is equal to d q e sine alpha and you might also like to note that d sine alpha is nothing but the perpendicular distance between lines of action of two forces and we also know that the quantity q d is electric dipole moment p so we can rewrite this equation as t is equal to p e sine alpha and since alpha is the angle between the vector p and e we can further simplify this expression to uh, a torque being a cross product of p and e or torque is equal to p cross e and you can see that torque would be maximum when p and e are perpendicular since sine of 90 is 1 and this torque will be 0 when they are parallel or in opposite direction when sine of 0 or 180 degree is 0. You would also see that the torque would have a tendency to always line up the dipole moment P with electric field E. 
So when alpha is zero, P and E are parallel. And if the dipole is moved from its position, the electric field will quickly align the dipole back to the original position. And this is what we call stable equilibrium. That is the torque is putting the dipole back to its original position. But if alpha is 180 degrees or the electric field and dipole moment P are in opposite directions, any moment of dipole will produce a torque that would reorient the dipole in such a way that P and E align resulting in the dipole attaining stable equilibrium. So when P and E are at 180 degrees uh, angle or they're 180 degrees apart, any shift in the dipole would reorient it such that it no longer remains in the original orientation what it was. So when the dipole is in such an orientation or alpha is 180 degree, we say it is in a state of unstable equilibrium. So if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and please do not forget to subscribe to this channel for many more interesting videos.